Welcome back to Ladies Can We Talk with Debbie George Addis. The second hour roundtable starts now. Hello, welcome back to Ladies Can We Talk. And my leading ladies are here joining me this evening are Carrie Kellerman and Lori Medina. Hello, ladies. Hey there. Hey, Debbie. And we're so excited. We have online someone I, I met several years ago. She is currently the Distinguished Senior Fellow in Residence and Director of the Armstrong Center for Energy and the Environment at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, Kathleen Hartnett White. Hello. 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 <laughs> You know, I've heard you speak, Kathleen, uh, at various conferences, and you're just always so full of knowledge. I always think, I wish I had my recorder running when she's talking, because you're uh, really just, uh, and just so our listeners know the depth of her understanding of issues. Prior to joining the Texas Public Policy Foundation, Kathleen Hartnett White served a six-year term as chairman and commissioner of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, Mm -hmm. so a state-level recognized, you know, serious, substantive position. Position, um, had regular regulatory jurisdiction over air quality, water quality, water rights, utilities. And I don't want to spend a lot of our time going through your resume, but you're obviously extremely well informed and uh, and uh, just have a lot to add to the discussion about climate change. So we started talking earlier about you know, tomorrow, the it starts, you know, whatever it is, December, November 30th starts the actual uh, UN conference on climate change. And all that's premised on, or a lot of the battle about climate change is premised on the idea that fossil fuels are bad, 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 and we have to get rid of them. So I understand you're writing a book about fossil fuels, and I hope that you, and just their place in, uh, in helping the world. So I'd love if you'd tell our listeners about your upcoming book and your thinking behind it. I'd, I'd be happy to. I'm staring at a screen of one copy right now. The book is called Fueling Freedom, hmm. Exposing the Mad War on Energy. And I'm privileged to have a co-author, Steve Moore, who was longtime chief economics writer for the Wall Street Journal. Mm-hmm. And you may, many people may know his voice and his face from frequent, many frequent appearances on Fox News to analyze things. And the book is about, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm really disturbed by the extent to which um, we're kind of walking over a cliff on uh, in this um, climate change era in which we live. Um, but the the all these policies um, would really aim to, as fast as possible, eliminate the use of fossil fuels. There's not a um, comparable alternative. Wind and sun and all of that may find their niche. But they are physically incapable of providing kind of concentrated, versatile, um, highly abundant, controllable energy and fossil fuels. And the role that, that energy plays in our life from the kind of energy in fossil fuels is, um, is, is very rarely recognized. I think it's really important be, um, that we just take a moment and reflect on the extent of the dependence we have on fossil fuels why they have been so extraordinarily valuable, and what real benefits um, they have um, have contributed. One you don't hear too much is food. Food. The, the population of the world increased about six and a half times since 1800, which is when the Industrial Revolution occurred. We now have more food per person. There were many of those as old as I am to live through all the uh, concern about a population bomb and all that. Indeed, we have more food available per person across the world. And a absolutely necessary ingredient for that um, phenomenal accomplishment is natural gas. Fertilizer made from natural gas is probably responsible for 60% of the food supply, um, the growing food supply. Wow, I did not know that. So the the growing use of natural gas helps as a fer, as a fertilizer to produce more food. Yes, and it it's been used. Um, uh, it was discovered in the early 19th century the, the the method for producing this kind of fertilizer. But from 1950 on, across the world, um, it's been used to uh, reach extraordinary gains in the food supply. That's a we have so food. So, so much food available, and there's so much more food available even in developing nations that we don't even think about it um, because it's just, it's, it's, you know, even in my lifetime, the difference between the variety and the freshness and all of that, uh, and, not, and besides um, fertilizer, 
all kinds of you know mechanized um, farm equipment and refrigeration and storage and all of that. It's uh, energy intensive, and that is the energy, of course, from which um, all life on which all life depends. That's just one of of, of many things, but. The rate of economic modern, what people call modern economic growth, which began and increased slowly in the 19th century, in the 20th century, just went skyward. And it wasn't just uh, the kind of energy and fossil fuels, but our book um, submits that it was a necessary condition. It's not something that you lose a necessary dynamic of, of multiple um, dynamics in, in modern economic growth. So the, the decision we're making um, has, I think, far, far um, um, consequences than, than, you know, most of the public debates about it. And, and to look before, is it, uh, our book is offered as a look before uh, we leap um, into an a energy-scarce world. That's a scary term, an energy scarce world. And you know, one time we're speaking with Kathleen Hartnett White at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and she has a book coming out. Um, and it, I'm sorry, can you say the title of it again? It's called Fueling Freedom. Fueling um, Freedom. Ex- exposing the Mad War on Energy. That's a great title. It really is. <laughs> it is. I heard you comment once about how the, the uh, use of fossil fuels, which are the big villain in this whole uh, global climate change alarmism thing, that they really play such a role in just also just food distribution. Just when we could easily, I mean, if you were lived in some remote area prior to the use of fuels to easily have a multi- multiple vehicles or methods of transportation, you couldn't get food, medicine, all sorts of things easily transported. I, I think we lose track of that, the value of fossil fuels along those lines, too. And, the, you know, um, um, the claim that um, extreme weather events, you know, hurricanes, floods, tsunamis, and all of that um, are more frequent and more intense, and there's more human loss from them, is, is really not true. Now there's even our own, um, you know, Government agencies, NOAA and NASA, have to admit that actually that, that there's we're living in a milder period of climate than those things. But I mentioned those is the the kind of relief efforts when something really horrific happens somewhere in the world. The amount of energy we can immediately put into it with flying bulldozers and shipping food and all of that, all of that um, it takes massive amounts of, of energy that just flow throughout. Um, our lives uh, without any notice. Well, you could probably get those ships moving across the oceans with solar panels, right? I think they would be (laughs) on a fairly slow voyage. Yeah, Yeah. I I think Obama ought to lead by example and have Air Force One be solar powered. Ah. Hey, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We well, you know, I love this idea it is the fossil fuels have been so maligned as though they are akin to, you know, a, a death warrant. And they just I, I love the just refreshing and honest reality based check your book is talking about, about how fossil fuels have lifted not just Americans, but people around the world, especially the poorest people, mm. to have faster and quicker access to health care, food supplies, other basic life essentials because we use fossil fuels wisely in transportation. I think that's just, I think that fact is lost on people. So I, I love that point about your book. We also want to ask you, though, there was a lot of talk, and um, we want to hit on, I guess I want to quick ask you this, we need to go to a quick break for, and um, in about two minutes and come back after the break and we have a whole long list of questions, so we're all going to talk really fast. But quickly before the break, if, you, if I could ask you, Kathleen, the, so is your argument address, or your book address the idea that green energy sources just are simply uh, clearly inefficient or insufficient to replace fossil fuels? Yes, actually a big, big part of it, because the gamble that, that all these climate policies are, are are, are making is that wind and sun and, and biomass, and you know what that is? Wood and plants um, can, can replace fossil fuels. Maybe, the, maybe a little more expensive, but that life will be the same, and life will not be the same. Oh my and gosh. I'd be happy to talk about that, um, including what's already going on in Germany and England, countries very much like our own, um, who, who took, made the leap. Uh, five or six years earlier, and what the kind of consequences are there um, 
including, um, as they their major media reports, hundreds and thousands of uh, middle and low income households who no longer can afford uh, electricity that is at this point in time for Germany three times higher than the average rate we pay in the United States. And that's not that's a very different kind of impact than a 10 percent increase in your electricity. Everybody should think about what um, their electric um, what their lives would be like if their electric bill was three times higher. I, for one, no, I couldn't live in this home. <laughs> so, Kathleen, are you, are you, you are saying that increase in electricity prices is directly attributable to the use of green energy sources being... Absolutely, okay. and, I, and I can speak more, more on that. Um, after our um, break. <laughs> after your break, or I can do so now, however you prefer. We probably have to jump off. I'm so glad you can hang on during the break. This is Debbie George Addis, Carrie Kalman, and Lori Medina. We're speaking with Kathleen Hartnett-White. This is Ladies Can We Talk on 660 AM, The Answer. Come back after our break, because she has so much more valuable information you need to know to be a preserver of liberty in America. Hello there. Welcome back to Ladies Can We Talk and our leading ladies in the second hour round table. I have Lori Medina and Carrie Kellman here, and we are speaking with Kathleen Hartnett White of the Texas Public Policy Foundation in this show dedicated to really thinking through the climate change alarmism agenda as we see that we have starting tomorrow in Paris, the U- UN Conference on Climate Change, and the importance of er- everyone feeling like you can understand this issue, you need to understand it, and you need to be part of this part of the answer. The message to Washington and to Austin that says, don't do these big, massive changes in our society you know, without really thinking through what it's going to mean to us. So before the break, Kathleen, you were talking, I'm sorry, we were going to, which side were we going to go to first? You were going to go to fracking? Well, um, either one fracking or, or my, my perspective as a woman on these issues. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Why don't you yeah, tell us as a good. woman on these issues? That'd be great. Um, I was startled when I read a few years ago of, about um, kind of the the history of the Industrial Revolution and how that changed life so, Mm -hmm. so much. And it it still just sort of stuns me. And um, most historians will believe that, you know, that the Industrial Revolution is the first time when a methodical way a human society tapped the really dense energy in fossil fuels. Before that, it's really what what nature produced, you know, everything, natural fibers, you harvested um, crops and, and used, you know, bone from animals to make things and all that. But anyway, get consider um, the ma- unbelievable changes which have occurred since then. Lifespan in 1800 was around 24 or 25 years old throughout all human history. Oh, my gosh. And not because you didn't have older people. You had to what, you know, really gets me in my heart. You had um, 30% of children died before they were 15. Mm, that's sad. And the um, and these are sad things or images to evoke, but because of the incredible economic growth and all kinds of improvements we have had since 1800, the lifespan is now three and a half times uh, greater than that, 79 mm-hmm. in this country. Mm-hmm. And the, but just to try to imagine what it would be like as a woman to lose more of your children, you know, to lose all of your children or more of your children. I, I, I think of Thomas Jefferson and his wife, Martha, who I believe she had six children. Um, she died after, uh, shortly after the sixth one, um, all but one uh, died before they were 15. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, there were lots of families like that. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. to me, I mean, to imagine that, that what, you know, common cold take the life mm-hmm. of a newborn. And that that precious gift of a longer lifespan mm-hmm. and, and the productivity made possible by fossil fuels, which would be impossible in this case for, for wind and all kinds of powerful machines and devices, you know, um, gave stimulus to this extraordinary economic growth where the average income compared to 1800, the average person um, is now about um, seven to ten times higher, and plenty of work, which no one questions. That when when income rises, health rises, um, education rises, all kinds of things. So this, uh, we who you know, living this very unique time in world history, at the height of all the benefits uh, that we have through using and converting uh, vast amounts of energy, are are really. Um, um, 
you know, at issue, that mm-hmm. these climate policies would, governments would choose not to um, keep on this <laughs> wonderful uh, line of growth um, and improving the living conditions for everyone, not just for the wealthy. And that's what these climate policies uh, would be a very weird thing. Be the first time in human history that mankind chose less. <laughs> um, I mean, the the basic human impulse, you know, for more food, for um, for more, more secure and comfortable <laughs> shelter, and um, the greatest gift of fossil fuels. And this again makes me think very much as a woman um, is time. Um, the t- one longer lifespan, you know. Who, who knows how many with the genius of, of Beethoven or Thomas Edison, mm-hmm. um, you know, children that were lost. But it gives um, all the conveniences that seems trite to talk about, all our household conveniences. But look at the time that that adds to a day where the, where the machine does the work for you. And lots have been written that really just that change mm-hmm. really transformed you, uh, women's lives more than any else gave more time perhaps for further education, gave more time uh, perhaps whether it was for volunteer work or for someone that wanted a career. Mm -hmm. But that's been a huge, huge gift um, of our energy-rich society. Yep. Uh, Kathleen, I have a question. Um, There have been some predictions about how much fossil fuel we have and how long it's going to last. Has how does fracking, the new method of gaining more oil and natural gas, how does how is that affecting the quote unquote stores of energy? And oh, uh, I'd be happy to because that's also something that I don't think is appreciated uh, by kind of the national media. Through the process of fracking, we now have access to the lion's share of all the oil and gas we knew were in, you know these geologic formations, but couldn't get to them. The average conventional oil well uh, going vertically may get 1% to 3% of the actual oil and gas oh, I in didn't the geologic know formation. Um, hy- hydraulic fracturing right now, with um, all the refined technologies they're using, um, maybe get 7%. Oh, my what, goodness. What, what fracking, and someday I think this revolution will be known Unless it's t- totally stymied, it's, it's natural evolution by climate policy. But it'll be something as much of a turning po- point, I think, for um, really the world, um, hmm. like the Industrial Revolution was. Because this is what wow. geologists call the shale, is the, what they call the source rock, or yep. the cradle of the, of the fossil fuels. Mm-hmm. So, you know, cooking over millions of years. Um, and so it's the amount of energy it is, and there there's shale all over the world. We're not, we did not, the United States was not first on this because we had it. This is the case all over the world. But we're first because uh, of creative technology, because of economic freedom, you know, risk-taking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, oil men are investors. Federal government didn't have anything to do with it, and mm-hmm. it's, um, it, um, it's an amazing opportunity. Is there any truth to the the argument? I saw some recently saying that fracking has been proved to not be polluting groundwater. The whole argument a lot in the left had is fracking dangerous, have dangerous side effects? Um, I would say anything has has risks. Um, And as we get more and more comfortable, people seem increasingly intolerant to any risks. But you never eliminate risk if you uh, get out of bed in the morning. Um, But... um, (laughs) To, to set the record straight, all the claims of contamination by groundwater, of, of groundwater, even EPA, after years of study and claims, has agreed have not occurred. Amen. Um, there have been some, some you can get, you know, um, it's a well casings. I don't want to get too technical about oil and gas, but there perhaps were some shallow um, problems, but none. They're going so deep. They're going so deep, so below the water table in, mm-hmm. in groundwater formations. And also, um, even since this it's such a recent phenomenon, uh, five, six, seven, eight years, however you want to date it, but there have been, um, you know, relatively no major enduring uh, problems. They're still studying the, the earthquake issue. And by the way, these were all of the little tremors that um, mm-hmm. have been reported, and not that many, but there have been some, mm-hmm. um, are at very, very low levels. And I'm an optimist. I don't want to, you know, I hopefully not, you know, unrealistically at all. Um, but if you look at this, the history of technology 
and of environmental sensitivity and actual reductions in pollutants and all of those. The, the, all the trajectory is toward more and more and more safe, less risk, uh, more efficient reduction of real pollutants. And that's also something you don't hear very much in this debate. If you burn fossil fuels without any controls on them, you get a lot of pollutants that can impair human health. But the amount of control technology and the refinement and the efficiency um, is extraordinary. EPA's own data has it on EPA's own website has that data, and yet we hear from our government, uh, most regrettably, pure propaganda. You know that the pollution levels are so high, real pollution, um, not CO2. That is not a in the air we breathe is certainly not a harmful gas we exhale. Uh, carbon dioxide, mm-hmm. but but we have a, the record, um, the record of real environmental um, improvement, and you know what it takes. It takes having a very prosperous society, um, because you know profitable and, and prosperous enough to use uh, very significant money to for all those emission control for all those emission control technologies. That's what's challenging China. It wants to get electricity to its vast populace uh, fast, and that's understandable. Um, many people write how just the, pre- just the addition of electricity transforms lives and, and things like health uh, um, and things like that. But, Absolutely. You know. Absolutely it does. And as we're wrapping this up, this is Lori, Kathleen. And, uh, you know, I, my last question is, I mean, we've had so much fantastic information from you, and we just love it here. But, you know, for our listeners and uh, moms and dads that are listening out there and people that care about our state and care about our country that think of things in a conservative standpoint, why, why is this important to them? I mean, why, how does this really affect their lives and, and, and why is this important to them and why should they care that, that uh, these climate alarmists are, are presenting false information to us and, and trying to really manipulate information and trying to drive the narrative? Why is this important to them? Um, I'd be happy to share my, my, my perspective on that. One, as, as we have discussed some today, um, these climate policies, um, by making energy scarcer and more expensive, are really risking a necessary condition of a, of a, of a, of a prosperous society. And that's, that's a very, very, very important thing to recognize, that, that kind of energy in fossil fuels, not any energy, is a, not the only necessary condition, but it is a physically necessary condition for the lives we live. The other is all the climate policies, and many of those who, who promote them totally admit this, assumes a much more powerful federal government um, or even gl- global governance, which I don't think many Texans <laughs> <laughs> right. or, or right. many exactly. Americans think, um, think is a good idea. And that, that is also not something admitted. And our personal freedoms are at stake. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, are they going to ration the number of miles I can drive to work? Do I have to move someplace? So I, I, that'd be an example. Those have been discussed. Right. That's excellent. Um, excellent. So per- personal freedom and, and prosperity mm-hmm. that we have been so, so blessed to mm-hmm. enjoy in this country. We are speaking tonight with Kathleen Hartnett White. I can tell you we could listen for two more hours because you're so knowledgeable about the both the science of climate change and the blessings that fossil fuels have brought to America. I want to thank you so much for calling in tonight to Ladies Can We Talk. And we're going to call you again, Kathleen. (laughs) Thank you, Kathleen. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. And I love the idea of your show with Ladies Let's Talk. Oh, thank you very, very much. This is Debbie Georgiatis, and we actually have Carrie Kelman, Lori Medina here, my second hour leading ladies. We're going to zip off to our break, and we're going to have some, we have amazing things to share in the last half an hour about...